Uh, good afternoon. Um, you're very welcome to the first in a series this semester, spring semester, of uh, our research seminars on the MA in Youth Community and Social Regeneration. As you see from the poster around the campus, we have a mixture, as ever this year, of academics, of activists, of uh, practitioners in uh, the field. And I'm delighted today to introduce uh, Lisa McKenzie, who combines activism with academic work in, in a really, really significant way. And we're delighted that Lisa is here to give a uh, first talk uh, today uh, in the series uh, on the MA in Youth Community and Social Regeneration. Um, Dr. McKenzie is a research fellow with, with the great British class survey team in the Department of Sociology at the London School of Economics and Political Science. And she's working on issues of uh, social inequality and class stratification through ethnographic research. Lisa brings an unusual and innovative approach to research by means of her extensive experience of bringing the academic world and the local community together. And many of you will have seen uh, quite recently that Lisa has contributed to uh, The Guardian newspaper and to BBC Radio following the publication of her book, which I really highly uh, recommend to you, called Getting By. So over to you, Lisa. Thank you. Hello. Um Thank you so much for inviting me to Ireland. It's the first time I've ever been, and I'm really pleased to be here. As I say last night, uh, I had the strange experience of being one of those, probably many people that have got a long lost uh, Irish father that I, <laughs> that I didn't meet till I was 21. Um, and when I met him, I was really disappointed because he was really posh. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, had gone to elocution lessons to get rid of his Irish accent. So uh, it was a massive disappointment to me. I was hoping it was going to be sort of uh, uh, an Irish uh, sort of Republican with strong. I thought that's where I might have got my activism from, but sadly I didn't. So coming, so coming to Ireland is, you know, hopefully I'm going to meet really interesting uh, activists and people that have probably got similar ideas around the, the monarchy that I have. <laughs> it's very difficult to find those opinions in the UK. But um, today, really, what I want to talk about is the state of austerity. And I know here in Ireland, I know that you have a lot of experience of this. Um, just coming from the airport yesterday, I saw these monuments to failed capitalism all over the place. You know, buildings that have not quite been finished because whoever... Um, started them, couldn't make enough money and pissed off. So, you know, I know that here in Ireland you understand austerity. But I think what I wanted to show you today really is the way that austerity is felt and experienced in England, particularly in Nottingham, where I'm from. Um, I've lived in London for 18 months, and that place is a completely different. And I think that's probably something that I've, I've, if I've got time at the end, I'll talk to you about, is the difference between what's happening in London, in the capital, and then really how the rest of the UK <coughs> is a completely different place altogether. Uh, London is probably the most terrifying place in the world, actually, um, for lots of different reasons, but it's also a very inspiring place. But what I'm going to do today really is talk to you about... I suppose what inspired me to do to write this book, um, what inspired me, why I did it, um, and then some of the backlash that I've had since I've wrote this book. So, that's a really crap picture. Getting by, well, what was it? I suppose, what, what is it? It's, believe it or not, this is 10 years, really, of research um, in the St Anne's neighbourhood in Nottingham, or, although it's 10 years' worth of or eight years official ethnographic research, it's really a lifetime, sort of 46 years experience of being a working class woman. Um, so really there's a lot in this. And although it doesn't seem that, you know, that it's that much, I think what I wanted to do with this is get depth. Really sort of use the language and get the depth and the practices and really sort of explain in a very sort of authentic way about this estate, this council estate in Nottingham. So uh, I lived in, in St Anne's from being 18 to 18 months ago till I was 45. Um, so it was a place that was home, it was where my son had grown up, my son had gone to school there. Um, 
And while I was living there for most of the time that I lived there, I was working in shops in the town or worked in factories. So I've got no real um, academic experience. I've left school at 16, didn't have any qualifications. I can't, I don't think I did. I remember I went, I left my job for half a day to take uh, one of my exams because you used to do that then. You used to start work in May and if you had exams, you'd go back, you'd ask for half a day off work and you'd go back and do your exams. I don't know if any of you ever did that. But uh, I think I remember taking two exams, so having two half days off work, but I couldn't afford it, um, so I didn't take the rest. So I had very little academic experience or life. Um, but what I did, I suppose, have is a real curiosity and a real sense of injustice of what was happening to where I'd lived and the people that I live with. Uh, I've grew up in on a council estate in a mining town just outside Nottingham. And after the 1984-85 miners' strike, the place where I lived was devastated. Um, there was no jobs. The mines had gone. All the, the industries that supported the mine industry um, had gone. Um, the factory that I worked in, which was the Pretty Polly, we made for tights. You've got, you had one here in Killarney because we used to do work. I remember we had Killarney work. So we would, so the, the tights were sort of, um, they were made in Killarney and then we would, then we used to dye them. I don't know, did any of you, has ever, did any of you work there or know that? Or know the pretty poly factory in Killarney? Yeah. I, I was, that's the only, that's the only part of Ireland I'd ever heard of because we used to get these tickets that said Killarney on them and it was the Killarney work. Um, so I worked at pretty poly for nine years and then that closed uh, they sent that the work and the factory went over to um, East Asia, I think, somewhere. And the estate that I lived on and the town that I lived on in, in sort of in Ashford, just outside of Nottingham, had been, it was devastated. And actually still is. 30 years on, um, it's, dev it's a devastated place. So I moved into St Anne's in Nottingham um, and I had my son there and he grew up there. And I'd always had this sense of injustice that there was something wrong. I'd never knew what that was. You know, when you were at school, you kind of said, you told, well, if you tried harder or if you worked harder, you know, you'd be better. Something better would happen to you. You know, you messed about at school. You know, I messed about at school because I was bored. You know, school was... Te uh, you know, I was being taught in a system that was teaching me to go into a factory. You know, my careers interview when I was 15, basically, I sat down and they said, which factory are you going to work in? And I said, I'm going to go to the Pretty Polly with my mum. And that's what I did. And so I'd been, so my education really was about preparing me to work in a factory. So it's, it's really basic, and I was bored. I'd left by the time I was sort of 14 and a half, I just stopped going. Um, so, but I'd always felt that there was something, there was an injustice, there was something happening, but I didn't know what it was. So when I got to. I know, I was 31 when I went to university. Went on an access course. Do you have access courses? Yeah. Has any of you come through access? <coughs> you do. You do. You teach on access course. Access courses are incredible. Um, do you, are they still? Are they affordable here? Yes. Is it free? Yeah. <laughs> Three thousand pounds in in England. The cha uh, the Tories um, <coughs> removed all adult funding. So there's no funding for adult education over 25, if you're over 25. So an access course now will cost you £3,000, which, as you know, that is, that's not making it... Ex that means that education is not accessible anymore. Um, what you can do if you, are, if you can't afford the £3,000, which is basically no one, you can add it on to your student loan. So the student loan that you get out for £9,000 a year then gets £3,000 added on. If you don't finish the access course or you don't go to university, and those of you who teach or know anything about access courses, it's really difficult to get people to stay on and to, to finish because they've got all sorts of other things happening in their life. You just owe the £3,000. So the way that I got into university really has been closed off now and that to me is heartbreaking because people always say to me um, well you've got a second chance and I really argue with that I had no second chance I didn't even get a freaking first chance 
You know, when you're, at, when you're at school, you're being taught to a level where you go and work in a factory. That's not, you didn't mess up that first chance. You just didn't get it. The first chance I got really was, a, was through the access course. So for those of you who teach adults and are committed to access courses, you know, so, you know, solidarity and the most respect to you because really for working class people that's our, that's our first chance. Um, so I ended up at the University of Nottingham. Um, first time I'd ever been to the University of Nottingham was the interview that I had to go there. And I lived in Nottingham for all my life. Never been into the university campus. It's actually very similar to this campus. It's kind of away from the city a little bit. It's, it's in its own sort of grounds. Um, and I don't know about this campus, but the University of Nottingham campus didn't really lend itself well to the city. People that, were, that lived and were from Nottingham really didn't have any relationship with the University of Nottingham. So when I went there, I was in awe of it, really. Um, and when I got there... I realised that I was the only mature student, I was the only local person, I was the only Nottingham person, and also I was the only mother. So <laughs> it was a really odd world for me to find myself in. But still, I was really, I was, I was absolutely in awe of being there. And I remember the first lecture that I had, we, had, we, we were giving a lecture, something around women and work, and the lecture was talking about systems and structures and the way that it disadvantages work and advantages work for others. And I remember sitting there thinking, do you know what, I knew this. I always knew this. And that's what education has given me, really. It's not that it ever, it ever taught me something new. It kind of cemented what I felt, this feeling that there was something fundamentally and structurally wrong, and perhaps it wasn't all my fault. And when I got this lecturer, who was obviously been given the legitimacy to speak because she was a doctor, you know, I kind of went, you know, I'm not mad after all. I'd suspected this. And obviously this person, this important person, is telling me what I suspected was right. And actually from that, that's when I went, you know what, this is what I want to do. I want to be able to stand up in front of people and I want to say, tell my story, but also what I want to do is really expose the way these structures and power systems work because this cannot keep happening. We cannot keep having young working class girls and boys sat in classes thinking that it's all their fault. And at that point, I thought, this is what I want to do. So really, that was the motivation for the book, it was the motivation for the work that I do. It's the motivation for the activism that I do. Um, you know, and it probably, and those of you who recognise my story, it will stay with us for the rest of our lives. It never goes away. <laughs> There's never a point when you think, I've done enough now. Because more you know, more you realise that there's work to be done. So for me, I think this is the start. This really is only the start. This is the beginning. Um, I've got much more to say and much more to write about. And every day that I'm alive and I see the way power works, I realise that actually, you know, as a sociologist, this is my responsibility. You know, I don't see myself as a teacher of the subject called sociology. I see myself as a critical um, and radical sociologist. You know, the work that I do is critical... Um, it's also theoretical, you know, so it's not all about getting out on the streets and talking to people. Um, ethnography is a highly critical subject with at least 50% of the work that you do is, is reading theory. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not someone that sort of says that the whole of academia is elitist and I'm not involved in it, because actually I believe strongly that theory helps us to expose um, and critique power. So, when did my research officially start? Well, I did the um, undergraduate degree. I did my uh, access course, which was a year. I did my undergraduate degree, three years. I got an ESRC grant, which was a one plus three. And so I started the PhD um, in 2004. But, like I said, I think the research started much earlier. Um, and it really started from this book. I don't know if any of you have come across it or heard of it. 
It's called Poverty and Forgotten Englishman by Ken Coates and Sil Bill Silver, 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 and, and it was written in 1967. The research was done between 1964 and 1967. Um, and this is St. Anne's. This is the neighbourhood that I live in, or lived in, till last year. Um, this is how it looked in 1967. And I came across this book while I was on the access course. And like I said, thank God for access courses, because if it wasn't for that access course, I wouldn't have gone to... What I might have done is gone to university and, became, and perhaps done a social work course, because I knew other women that had done that. So, so, and also I wanted to give something back to my community. But it was this book, and when I read this book, I thought, you know what, I want to do this. I didn't know that, that you could go to university and you could study neighbourhoods, particularly the neighbourhoods that I lived in. Because the neighbourhoods that I lived in, I thought nobody was interested. You know, it was shit all. So who would be interested where I lived? Well, actually, what I, what I found, that people were interested, and actually the neighbourhoods that I lived in were more than just... They were interesting. And so I read this book, and actually there was a documentary that went with it. You can get that documentary on YouTube now. I really recommend that you get it. It is a fantastic documentary. It's called Poverty in St. Anne's. Um, I think it's under sort of Gimme Shelter. They showed it again in the 1980s. Um, and I showed it to a group of PhD students from the LSE last week at Windsor Castle, of all places. And um, I've watched this film many, many times, and I've actually watched it with the people that made it in the community. And I've watched it many times, and I've just watched it. But last week, when I saw it again, actually, me and the whole of the stu other students were crying because there's something about this, the times that we live in now, the austerity that we're experiencing now. There's something about seeing how stark it it was then and the similarities now. And there's something that's really heartbreaking about that. You know, people in the, in the 1960s were talking about hope and getting out, and perhaps their husbands getting a better job, or perhaps them getting a better job and things would be better for them. And looking back now, when you're in 2015, and you know that it didn't get any better, you know that things didn't change, there's something really heartbreaking about that. So sort of seeing the generation before us having hope that then the next generation crushed. There's, there's something very powerful in that narrative. Um, so I recommend, you know, if you've got 45 minutes, watch that film. Um, so for me, why did I do ethnography? Because I think narratives and storytelling are really important, and especially for working class people, because it's through the narratives and storytelling, really, that our lives are told. Um, and usually told about us. But what I wanted to do really is tell the story of, from my perspective, from a working class perspective. So for me, the working class communities and working class people speak in narratives. You know, so those of you who've done research or done any sort of research in working class families or neighbourhoods, you'll know if you go in and ask a direct question, you'll get nothing. People will look at you and go, or they'll give you the crappiest answer, or the basic, the most basic answer, because they just they know what you're asking. So they go, right, okay, what are they asking? What do they want me to say? And you play this game. And so what I what I learned a long time ago, actually from my own life experience, is not to do that, because that's not how working class people want to talk. What they want to do is they want to tell you the story. So for me, the ethnography is perfect because I sit there and just go. Just, just tell me something about yourself. And, and people say, well, I was born here, and then I did this, and then this happened, and then my mum did that, and, and let them talk. I've had interviews that last for five and a half hours. But the storytelling is important. And really, that's what I wanted to do with this book. I wanted it to be, yeah, I wanted it to sort of bring out the academic um, critiques of power, but I also wanted the storytelling to be really to be central, because that's how we that's how we talk about power. We we talk about power from the past. You know, we we, we our lives are contextualised in, I suppose, history, and that is why I think this book was really important because what I could do then is map the stories 
of the people in 2007, 2008, 2009, 2010, and up to 2012, but I could map it back. And this is why I think our research, the research that we do in university, particularly in universities actually, so I'm not absolutely, I don't absolutely bite the hand that feeds me. I know that what we do is really valuable um, and we need to keep doing it. The work that we do is highly contextualised and we think about it and we care about it. And you were just saying earlier that you went in last night, flicked the telly on, first thing that comes up, I and mean, we've all done it, is some awful programme about council estates or benefit street or some vile thing that kind of is not contextualised it's got no narrative to it whatsoever it's really just sort of a collection of, of sort of an opinion sorry an opinion of a, an editor and so what we do I suppose as sociologists and what I do is really co- collect that sort of context that context there's a story in this book, I don't know if any of you have read it. Uh, it's called Gucci Sunglasses. And I've wrote this story and it killed me right in that story. It absolutely killed me. And not because it's even a bad story. I know but I know terrible stories about people's lives that are awful and that are hurtful and painful. And I would never tell those stories actually. So there is something about the way that we edit and the way that we the lens we look through. But this story really wasn't a bad story, but it gave me nightmares. And that's when you know you're a sociologist. That's when you know you're an ethnographer, when the data that you're collecting, the research that you're doing, actually keeps you awake at night. You know, you're not just sort of firing it out, thinking about the ref. That's, you know, that may be what an academic does. That's not what a sociologist or an ethnographer does. You know, it's the stories that keeps us awake at night. And there's one story um, about a woman who... About three years ago, I knew her really well, and she came up to me, was in the gym one day, and she said, uh, oh, do you know what, Lisa, she told me for weeks and weeks, she was fed up, she'd had enough of having no money, she's got three kids, she was sick of the house, she wanted to decorate the house, the house looked like shit, you know, it just looked crap, it made her depressed going in it, and she was just saying, I've had enough, I've had enough, I've had enough, and then one day she said to me, you know what, am I a bad mum? And I was like, Why? Because the thing is, for working class women, I suppose this is what I learned, really, when you start to really research um, working class families, is for working class women, the most important thing is to be a mother. And being a good mum is the, is the most important thing for you, because it's the way that you're valued on the, on the, in the neighbourhood where you live. So being a good mum means everything. If you, take, if you strip away career and education and all the other stuff that perhaps middle class women value themselves with. What working class women have is motherhood. And actually it's really valuable to them. And it's really valuable to the community. So being a bad mum is about as bad as it could get. And she said to me, am I, bad, am I a bad mum? And I was like, why? She says, because you know what, I've run out of money. And the only thing we've got in the house tonight is cornflakes. So the kids are going to have to have cornflakes for the tea. And I was like, that's not bad. You know, I've done it, my mum did it, we've all done it at some point. Everybody on a Thursday night's had cornflakes. It's not, you know, and the kids won't care. And she was like, no, I suppose not. And I could see it was really upsetting her. The next day she'd got her money, she'd got her benefits. Um, she came in the gym and she got two or three bags of shopping and she was dead up She was in a better mood. Um, and in the gym that I used to work with training and sort of doing researching, uh, it was that kind of gym where you could buy anything. So you could buy, like, I mean, I bought two Waitrose chickens once. <laughs> you, could, you could buy any, anything in the gym. So on a Friday, people would come in with, like, packs of bacon and all sorts of stuff. And this day, this lad had come in and he'd got um, sunglasses. Uh, and he'd got Gucci sunglasses. And they were nicked, but they, were, they weren't snide sunglasses. They were real sunglasses, real Gucci sunglasses that would probably sell about £250 each. And he wanted 25 quid. So he brought them in, and like everybody was that excited. And she bought a pair. And, she, and I remember putting them on, and everybody was going, oh, they look dead nice, and you should definitely buy them, you should definitely buy them. And she bought the pair of Gucci sunglasses for 25 quid, which would have been a big chunk out of the benefits. And I remember thinking, and you know what, the joy that she got out of that 
And the months later when people, you know, she'd come into the gym and say, oh, my mate saw me and she said, oh, I look dead nice in them sunglasses. And the, the, the value they were to her. But I just thought about that story and then I thought about the headline in the Daily Mail where it was like, you know, women buying Gucci sunglasses with, uh, while their kids are eating cornflakes. And I just thought about that headline and I thought that story was so important to tell because it was really about the way that poverty drives you down. And that when you've got, you know, and I always hear this crap from people going, why don't working class people save their money? It's like, you know, you've got no money to save. You know, she, why didn't she spend that 25? Why didn't she save it? And it's just completely not understanding and missing the point that what those Gucci sunglasses did was they just made her feel like part of the rest of the world again. You know, because everybody else can afford Gucci sunglasses, or it appears that everyone else can. And so for her, it was sort of, it was making her feel like she was a part of the world, that she wasn't this scumbag person that couldn't afford to feed her kids or couldn't afford to decorate her house. And so for me, that's what ethnography is. It really captures the whole story. So with that story, but I spend about three pages contextualising it. The story literally is a woman coming in the gym, buying a pair of sunglasses, done. But then I spend another three or four pages really unpacking it, because I need to make sure that anybody reading that story is not under any illusion what I am saying with it. And I, must, I really struggled with that story, whether to put it in or not. Because all I could see was this frigging Daily Mail headline you know, women don't feed their kids but wears designer sunglasses. But I thought, no, this is really important. Because at the time I was writing that, there was a big debate on, on whether uh, how big people in council estates televisions were. You know, and whether people in council estates should have a mobile phone and, and all of this. And, you know, I, and I was reading at the time the road from Wood to road, the road to Wigan Pier, and the same debates were being had in the 1930s about working class people. And one of the things that George Orwell writes was that the middle class constantly remark upon how much sugar working class people put in the tea. You know, and one of the things was, if they didn't put this much sugar in their tea, they could afford this. You know, George Orwell's response to that, and mine really, is the same. If your life is filled with cold and, and, and sharpness and harshness, why wouldn't you want the comfort of some sugar in your tea? And this, I think, was what the sun Gucci sunglasses were. I think they were the sugar in her tea. So I think, for me, this is, this is what I do. So I do all the activism stuff, and I do, I really do. I get out on the streets, I occupy buildings, I fight with the police if I need to. I am a direct action activist. But at the same time, I don't ever forget that there is a need and an importance for the contextualising of these stories. So really, this is what this book is. It's recognising the importance of history, recognising narratives, and also building that relationship within the community as well. You know, explaining why it is what it is. I don't even know where I am. So I'm going to do a bit of ethnography now. Uh, I always do this. Can you see this? Do you need some ethnology? Right, that's drama. Tell me what you think. <coughs> yeah, I mean, it's not a trick question. So, what, what can you see there? What is it? Pardon? It's really, you know, it's not a trick question, it's a fence, it's a metal fence. Um, and again, this is about context, and this is about building up the context. It's a metal fence. So, so what? It's a metal fence. Well, actually, this is St. Anne's. This is the estate that I write about. This is the estate that I lived in for 22 years. And where you are, so this is the ethnography, where you are is a perspective. You're seeing this from a group of people that I did research with. And the group of people were uh, four, three-year-old kids. I was in the, and this is the school play, this is their school playground. And what we were doing one day is I was, we got cameras and we were, so I was saying to these three year old kids who were remarkably able to take photographs, so, you know, three years old, they can do everything now. Um, you know, give them a mobile phone, they're, they're away. 
and they took the, and I'll say, let's take photographs of where we live. And they were taking photographs of what they could see, and they were like, oh, this is town, so that's the city centre, that's town, and St Anne's is kind of on a, on a hill. And we, we're sat in the, in the playground, so these kids go to nursery school, um, and then the, in this school, you can just see the junior school there. So you go in this building, you go to nursery school, and infant school, and junior school. Um, and this is how they see. And afterwards, when I looked at the photographs, I thought, this is how they see that the world. Because everywhere on this estate in St. Anne's is locks and bars and fences. I don't know if it's the same here. But for some reason, about 1990, they started locking up council estates and putting gates and bolts everywhere. And every school got, got locked in. And when I looked at this, I thought, this is the view from the, these kids say all their lives as they were looking from their playground into the city. This is the way they see this. Now, I'm not a social psychologist, but this must mean something. This must do, do something to a kid's development, the way they see the world, if they see their world through iron bars and locks. And I don't know what, but I suppose what I do is use this photo really as an example of you know, what it is that I try and do with the work that I do is sort of sit down on the floor and try and see it from the perspective of, of the insider. I lived on this estate for 22 years, but I was not a three-year-old on that estate. But this is the view, really, from the three-year-olds. So, the estate. This is, this is, the, this is the school from the other side. Uh, this is more of the gates and the locks. I don't, you know what, I have no idea why they did this. They did this in the City Challenge programme about 92. They just put gates and fences up everywhere. So this is kind of what the estate looks like. That's the city centre. And the estate is grey and concrete and full of gates and bars and locks. Um, this is the precinct. Uh, this is in 2010. That's the post office. It's a little boy who I knew his mum really well. Um, and this is an interesting thing, because this is 2010. Uh, the, the, the Tories came in in 2010 with the Lib Dems, and the austerity measures started almost immediately. And in communities like this, it was felt immediately. Um, it was incredible, really, that we, we got to this 2010 point from 2008 when the crash happened to 2010, kind of there was a bit, you know, something was happening, but 2010 it just, the budgets were slashed and it went. Um, the co-op went, that's not there anymore. The library went, that's not there anymore. This is a devastated area actually now. This was the only bit of community space we had and it's gone. Um, so I suppose my ethnic, if I was to go back now, I don't know where or what I would do, because there's not a cent this was the central point, and that's gone now. Um, like I said, all the, everything that I do really is about narrative and stories, and, this, and I also take hundreds and hundreds of photographs, Some, not usually for people, for people to see, I usually take them for me, myself. Is anybody here doing ethnography? or an ethnographer or doing any sort of research that is in communities. Because I just, do you use photographs? Because I, I really recommend getting a smart, with your smart, because now it'll be photographs, they're easy to take. And I mean, I used to, years ago, when I used to do things, you know, if I saw a poster in a community centre that I thought was interesting, I used to pull it off the wall and nick it, which is probably not a good thing, because that means other people can't see what's going on. So now, with a smartphone, I can just take hundreds and hundreds of pictures, and I've got thousands and thousands of them. So graffiti, anything really. Um, and what it does, it kind of helps me to remember and it builds those narratives up. So in between the photographs, I can start to think of a story behind it. So really, behind every one of these pictures, there's a story. I mean, I can tell you, you know, seriously, there's a story here. Um, this is about a woman that worked in the community centre uh, she worked there for 10 years as a volunteer. She used to wash the pots, clean the tables. She'd got two kids, never worked, always been on benefits. 
um, 2000, she, her role in the Dewey Centre was really important because she was a phase that everybody knew. She talked to young mums, she talked to old people, she was a proper community, you know, woman. But in the, in the view of the government, she never worked. She worked every day here doing this, every day. She'd turn up when the kids went to school and she'd go and pick the kids up at three o'clock. But that was not classed as work. In 2010, she got her benefits revoked. Um, they sanctioned her and she had to stop doing this because they said if she could do voluntary work, she could do paid work. They sent her to a cheese factory. So she packed cheese now. You know, nobody does this job now because that's not valued. And I suppose that's one of the things that I write about in the book is what's valued in communities and why it's not valued. Why it's, it's, it's not valued. For me, this woman did as much as, you know, her work there is far more valuable to society than packing cheese. What I think as a working class woman with two kids, I think she's been punished. And the thing that she wants to do, which is be part of her community, be valued and make the community a better place, is not important enough for the powers that be. So, she, you know, getting 50 quid a week, she needs to do better than that. So that's, that's, but there's stories like this everywhere in the research. Um, what time are we on? 25 days. Yeah. Well, I've got finished. Okay. Um, so I suppose for, the, to, for my research, really the logic of practice, this is where I start thinking about theory, is um, I am a Bourdieusian. I, I use the work of Bourdieu, particularly around practice. Um, the logic of practice, why do people do the things that they do? So, you know, the story of this woman here, you know, it appears that she is, and again, I'm sure, you know, Benefit Street came along, they go, oh, look at her, you know, never worked, got two mixed kids, you know, she just talks all day in the, in the community centre, but actually I didn't see it that way. What I saw is ex an extremely valued position in the community that actually was not valued by anybody else who wasn't in that community. Um, and sadly that includes social workers, people who work in housing offices, GPs, who I find some of them very unhelpful actually. Um, so for me, the logic of practice is really important. How people are valued, but also how their identity, how they see themselves. One of the things I find, I find in St Anne's, um, and if those of you know, sort of lived in council estates or know about the, uh, you know, working class communities, you might understand this. So when I said to people, tell me something about yourself, what they always said to me is, I'm typical St Anne's, or I'm St Anne's. So what they were doing was describing, they were saying, telling me where they lived, but also how that was really who they were as well. So it wasn't, so St Anne's wasn't just their, it, their, where they lived, it was who they were. So for me, and I'm St Anne's as well, because I've lived there for 20 odd years, so I was kind of like, all right, okay, you're St Anne's, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I knew what that meant. And then I went away and started to think about it and thought, well, I know what that means. But what do other, you know, no one else, what, what does that mean? So what I started to do then is really start to think about what it meant to be St Anne's. Um, and being part of this community was, was absolutely vital. Being St Anne's was really vital in order to stay here. And, and really it's a tough environment, it's a difficult environment, it's concrete, it's shit, it's got no money, not every, you know, there's lots of people who don't work in there. A lot of poverty. Um, we had a spate from 2003 to 2007 where it was called the gun capital of England. Um, there was this, you know, it's known as a place where there's drugs and crime and lots of single mums. And the rest of Nottingham would say, don't go there. It's a terrible place, don't go there. And actually, the University of Nottingham really started to panic at one point because they, the student numbers were dropping because the impact that St Anne's apparently was having on the city, because it was becoming this very dangerous place and it was ruining Nottingham. 
So the sort of rhetoric around this, this community was, don't go there, it's the worst place in the world. But the people that lived there wanted to stay there. They didn't want to go anywhere else. They really liked where they lived. And they used to always say to me, I'm typical Sayans. So if it was that bad, why would you identify with it? <laughs> why would you say, this is not just where I live, this is who I am? So for them, it was something, there was something else that was really important here. So what I started to do is really think about what it was. And basically, it was this sense of belonging and community and knowing people um, and being able to, you know, when, when everything else was shit, you'd got each other. So on the estate, the pubs were closing down at a rapid rate and there's not one pub left now, not one. But people have parties in their houses. So the thing is, if you are known and well-known and you belong, you get to go to people's, you get a social life. If you are a mother in there and you're on your own and you know people and you have mates in there, you get to have a babysitter. You know, if you are a man and you know everybody there, you know, you get to have mates, you get to have people to hang about with. So it became, you know, being part of this community became much more important than just living there. Um, this is one of the young lads, and I always kind of show this T-shirt, because on the estate is a non-profit sort of T-shirt shop where people make, print their own T-shirts up. And all the T-shirts that they print up all have something to do with St. Anne's, being proud of St. Anne's. Um, and this is one of them. This is the, remember the picture I showed you and you could see the city behind it? Well, this is actually on, the, this is on, a, on a T-shirt. But, you know, the kids that have made it have, have, you know, made it look a bit more appealing. You know, for them, that's how perhaps they want to see St. Anne's. Um, red and black is the colours. Uh, these sort of kids who you kind of they call themselves NG3 or stands, and that's what they see their colours as is red and black. Um, and so, you know, it, it's so to be part of this neighbourhood is so important that you know people are really identifying with it, and that's actually one of the travesties. Um, and that's one of the travesties, really, is what I see happening in London today, is communities are being pushed out wave after wave after wave. So when you, when everything, and I know for working class people that community is really important, it's everything, and actually it's the last thing that you've got, <coughs> is the community you live in. So taking that away from people is cruel. It's, it's actually vicious. Um, you know, I don't see that as this sort of gentrifying process of moving people out of communities, of changing their pubs, making them better places. I actually don't see that as progress. I see that as cruel and vicious because I know how important these communities, whether other people think they are shit or, or crap, does not bother me because I know they don't think that about their communities. Um, and again, that's that basic lack of understanding of people on the outside, of the people on the inside. Um, this is a tattoo that some of the women had. It's SV, which means Stansville, which is St. Anne's. Kind of a slang word or a local word for St. Anne's, Stansville. Uh, this woman had that tattooed on her. And so again, you know, this is what I try and hammer over here, that local identity is really important. Fitting in and being known is really important. Gives you a social life. Also gives you safety as well. Because the thing is, if you're known on the estate, you don't get any trouble, really. You don't get any... No one troubles you. Um, it was also a place, for other reasons, that women felt safe. I, I went there to this very unsafe neighbourhood, this very scary, terrible inner-city neighbourhood. I went there as a 19-year-old girl for safety because I was... Um, I just had my son, and my son was mixed race. Um, St. Anne's was a community, a very mixed community. Part, I mean, actually, there was uh, at least sort of thirty percent of the population in St. Anne's are uh, migrant Irish families, big Irish families, actually, in St. Anne's. Um, and then 
the rest is sort of a mixture between working class English and West Indian families. So, you know, to go there as a white mother with mixed race children meant that it was a place of safety as well, because it was a place that you could bring your kids up in, um, and your kids looked like everybody else's kids on the estate. So really, you know, this, this place that other people thought was dangerous was actually a really safe place. And again, that's the sort of misunderstanding of those on the outside. So if any of you do work in sort of services that go in to these communities, you know, just think about perhaps the way you're viewing it in contrast to the way that the people who live there view it. Um, and that's when I start talking about alternative value systems, really. The way that people on the inside start to create their own value systems. You know, what they're trying to do is they're thinking about the things that are lacking in their lives, and they think about the things that are not being provided, and then they start to create their own systems. So it's like I said, it's that system of babysitting, the system of the pubs are going, so we'll have parties in our house. Um, you know, the systems of people being devalued, and this is where I suppose it becomes really important for the rest of society, because when you've got groups of people who feel that they're being stigmatised and looked down on constantly on the outside of the estate, and they are, you know, this is not, you know, this is not chips on shoulder or imaginaries, because like you said, we're watching programmes on telly all the time about how terrible people are in council estates, you know, how awful their lives are, how crazy they are, how sort of animalistic they are, how expensive they are, they costed us all this money on, on benefits. So when these views are commonly held by other people, and you live in this community, why do you ever want to go outside? Why do you want to engage with the world that hates you, that thinks that you're crap, that looks down on you, and everything that you do, so what you wear, how you dress, how you speak, the way you walk, everything about you is, is kind of not good enough. So why would you engage with a world that doesn't like you? And this, I suppose, for me, is kind of the crux of it. This is where I, this is where I always get this thing of, you know, these communities, you know, they don't, they don't try and get out, they don't try and do anything. It's like, why would you? You know, the, uh, you know, I remember walking into a university for the first time thinking, God, you know, it takes a lot of, of... Luckily, I was 31 years old, and I kind of thought, you know, fuck you. I'm more, you know, I'll just be here and do what I'm doing. I'm here for me, I'm not here for you. To be an 18-year-old, 19-year-old that comes from this community and walks into a, an elite university and feels so different, why would you want to stay there? You know, when the accent that you have, when, you know, and women always ask me as well about the big gold earrings. They say to me all the time, why, because I wear big gold earrings, why do people think that's common? Why do people think that's rubbish? And I have no answer for that. And I ask everybody, and no one's really got an answer. People, because really, a pair, a pair of big gold earrings means nothing. It's arbitrary. But it is symbolic of something. And people know when they are being ridiculed and looked down on. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't go over the rest. They know. So really, for me, that's why alternative value systems start to be used inside. You know, ways of dressing. What, what does it matter if other people on the outside don't like the way we dress? Because actually, people on the inside, we do. So therefore, what you do on the inside of the community becomes far more important than what you do on the outside. Um... Then I went on and did, after sort of seven years with women, or six years with women, I went on and did men. And that was basically because people started asking me about where the men was. Um, and actually I didn't know, because I'd spent all the time with women. And in the places where the women were in the estate, the men weren't there. So did that mean that the men were just missing? Well, they were still on the estate, they were still part of the community, but they're in different places. So men and women were occupying different places. So the women were in the community centre, in the health centre, with the doctors, in the short start centres, um, in the libraries, stood outside schools. The men weren't there. The men were in other places. But again, that's a really common misconception of working class families. Because you don't see the men, or because you, know, you think the men aren't there, you think that the men have abandoned the families. But actually, that's not true either. 
So this common misconception about men abandoning families in working class communities is wrong. Um, I found the men. They were in the gym. <laughs> they were in the barber shop and they were in the chicken shop and they were hanging out with each other. That didn't mean that they were not part of their families in different ways. Um, the men saw the estate in very similar ways to the women. They felt that the, 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 the living in the community was really important. Women felt that they belonged to the estate. Men felt that the estate belonged to them. <laughs> but I don't think that's... Yeah, the, to, the estate was territory to the men that they, could, they, they needed to defend. Women felt that the estate was community that they needed to build. But the, the importance was still the same. It was really, it was that the community was, you know, what happened in there was really important. On a Monday morning in the gym, you know, the first two hours would be, you know, it was gossip about what had happened to who at the weekend. Men were just, you know, actually I've never known anybody gossip more than men. Men were, you know, I've known, I, the men would tell me what's happened in everybody's family and who'd fell out with who. Much more than the women ever looked. They knew everything. Um, I suppose I'll just finish it here, really. Is what happens, I'm really interested in unintended consequences. So when you've got this sort of constant bombardment by the state that people need to conform in different ways and austerity measures need to be implemented and harshness needs to come in and people need to learn and people need to get jobs and people need to get out of the communities and people need to, um, you know, be moving and global. You know, wanting the best for the two square miles where you live is just not good enough anymore. It means that you're not ambitious. There's something wrong with you for wanting to do that. Basically, there's unintended consequences with that. Um, and in 2011, we had riots in, in England, and in Nottingham, we had riots. Um, and I'm sure that you heard about them, I saw them on the telly, and you heard the rhetoric about the riots were about looting, and it was about young people looting shops. That really wasn't the whole story. The biggest story was young people attacking the police. And in Nottingham, seven police stations were burnt, were firebombed. Um, four police cars were firebombed. And actually, young people were attacking the police. And for me, this is really important because this is what happens when the state starts putting in almost like a military force to stop people reacting to those austerity measures. And what happens then is the police become the front line. They become the only face of the state. You know, when your doctors are closing and when your libraries are closing and when you can't get anywhere near your MP and when the political system starts moving further and further away from you and when nurseries start closing and everything that the state is supposed to provide becomes further and further away from you, what happens is these guys become the only face of the state. And actually, this is what's happening in England at the moment. There is a lot of unrest, a lot. Um, and this is the unintended consequences of it. And I have no idea where this is going. Um, and I suppose I'll just leave you now, really. The last thing, this is a couple of the lads that I actually were part of my research. On the day that the riots happened, they phoned or they texted me, they BB'd me on the Blackberry, because everybody was using Blackberries then. Um, and this is the roof of a private school in Nottingham, we've got this very sort of it's called Nottingham High School. It's a Ed Balls, the Labour minister, uh, went there. It's a really sort of really terrible school. And um, the day before, I've been in the barber shop arguing with this group of lads, saying to them because they were telling me that I don't know if you've got this there. We've got these sort of levels of conspiracy theories going on here <laughs> <laughs> about three men and, and uh, oh. What is it? Illuminati. And have you got all that happening here? Yeah, well, we've got that happening as well. And these, these young lads two days before were saying to me, it's the Illuminati and it's this big conspiracy theory and this is the problem and this is what's happening. They know something is wrong. They just don't know how to find out what that thing is. But they know something is wrong. 
So I'm saying to them, no, what's wrong is this private, uh, this private education. People don't need, don't need a big conspiracy theory here. They're actually doing it over in front of our face. You know, <laughs> you know, with, you know the unfairness and injustice is right in our face. It's not a conspiracy, actually. It's, it's, it's open. And, and, and I was talking to them about private education. So I got this text which basically said, guess where we are? And I was like, I don't know. And it was like... We're on the roof of that school that you ain't. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, ah, oh, goodbye. Because, <laughs> you know, people at that time were going to prison for two and a half years for putting on Facebook, go out and write it. So I was like, shit. Um, but anyway, when I spoke to them afterwards, and they all got arrested and they all got locked up for about two years, actually, for doing that. Um, when I spoke to them afterwards, they were, it wasn't a I was quite proud that they went up there, actually, because I thought, beginning of the revolution but actually it wasn't the police dogs had been let off the the leads and they just run to the nearest highest point which happened to be the school and then afterwards they realized where they were so it was not a big you know they weren't they weren't sort of having a political revolution they were just getting away from the police dogs <coughs> but and again what i'll do is just leave it here is as people in academia as people in in universities how do we engage with issues of social inequality and social justice? How are we doing this? We've got to think very carefully um, how we reuse our research, how we use our teaching. For me, I'm, like I said, I look at power, social inequality, injustice. My sociology is radical. It's about politics um, and it's critical. Thank you very much.